friends. My name is Andy Maddock. I'm the lead pastor here at Lunch United Methodist Church. It is an honor and a powerful, powerful privilege to stand before you uh, and to unpack God's Word and to spend this time uh, doing God's work together. I want to welcome you as we continue our series on wrestling with doubt. So we're doing this wrestling with doubt finding faith series. We started a week ago talking about the existence of God in the first place. Is there a God? Does science make the need for God uh, extraneous? And in the midst of trying to wrestle with deeper questions about the nature and existence of God, how then is there this through line where I would doubt a question that can God be loving to me or even to the whole of creation? And so we unpacked that as best as we could. Again, this is a series that invites you to come with your questions, to not check your mind, your doubts, your reason, your rationale, your capacity at the door. The faith found in the midst of this series is rooted in the possibility that God can show up in the midst of our questions and doubts. That we love and we serve a God that is somehow big enough and God enough, love enough to meet us in the midst of our speculations. That God ultimately, at the end of the day, doesn't demand, doesn't demand a specific consistency of ideology, but rather a pattern of character, and a deeply held belief, faith, in the midst of wrestling with our doubt. So our second series here ups the ante a little bit. It's a question on Scripture. Is the Bible true? And these are faithful questions that we're asking in the midst of our doubt series. Why? Because doubt invites us to consider and to make sense of those questions we have in our lives. Not unlike the toddlers of last week that ask why, there are plenty of why questions when it comes to the nature of the book that we as Christian disciples use and believe in. And those questions about the Bible are faithful they root us in something bigger than ourselves and they help us to long to understand something about what the Bible intends, what it intended, and what it may very well mean for our common future together. But when Reverend Adam Hamilton, the kind of impetus for this series, got into the deep questions and the deep end of the water with his people, the kinds of questions that were driven by Scripture took a kind of variety of patterns. A first and a big one was the Bible's treatment of women. Those that go unnamed, unlisted, uncared for, those that are used as chattel or collateral. How women are considered to be cast aside, that even in the time of Jesus, divorce is placed in the power and in the hands of husbands. Women not holding property or finding value. Of being less than, of told to being quiet in church and to not have authority over men. Faithful questions about the treatment of women. That some of the, the stories in the Bible that seem hard to swallow, and one of the joking ones in that regard is the story of Jonah and being swallowed by a fish. When you get into the weeds and try and explore the science of what sized fish and the fact that it doesn't even say whale in the book of Jonah, could one survive in for three months and what kind of stomach conditions would allow a human being to live and to breathe in that? And when we get into this struggle about the stories that we wrestle with, Rather than dealing with the impetus, why should Jonah go to Nineveh? What is his reluctance about? What's God's message for the people there? But beyond that, stories of the Old Testament and the New that are very difficult for us to wrap our mind around, to appreciate in their cultural context, and a big part of those stories and patterns lift up the question of violence, of racism, and slavery in our Scripture. There's a sanctioning of slavery that takes place in both the Old and the New Testament that we have culturally and responsibly found our way to the other side of to say this is not who we are in modernity and we will stand against it. But the violence that God seems to call for, particularly in the early Old Testament as the people are settling the Holy Land, the violence not just done against fellow warriors, but to women, to children, the raising of cities is a bitter pill to try and swallow. And even the racism that persists into the day of the New Testament, the kind of scorn of those of Samaria, even the disciples' first questions, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We all have these racist presumptions that are part of this scriptural narrative, and it's difficult for us to wrestle with them as questions. For many, 
The question of the truth of the Bible is rooted in the idea of accounting for errors and contradictions. And there are plenty. There are plenty of contradictions in the narrative of Scripture between where things happen, who they happen to, how many people were there to bear witness to it. And while there are faithful people who are trying to do the work of what we call synthesis, of trying to bring those stories together and have them make sense for us, the simple truth is, is that there are times where Scripture's narrative lines up in such a way that it is either one thing or it is its opposite completely. And then beyond that, and more specifically for us in the Christian church, is the synthesis of the Gospels. That Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and their reliance on one with another, paint a very similar picture of the story of Jesus. They each have their lens and their hope for how they tell us that story, but if we're being honest, there are nuances and differences in how they do that and who Jesus is presented to be. And then you have a Gospel of John that comes along, and Jesus doesn't talk like Jesus used to talk. So if you sat there and read those in chronological order as they appear to us in our scriptures, it would appear that the character of Jesus has gone through a radical change. If you or I did that in any of the other books that we read in our common life, we might find ourselves both confused and maybe a bit put off. And so those were the questions that were at the heart of the people and that we as the church and me as a pastor find myself needing to wrestle with because the simple truth is is that in light of one of those But perhaps in the preponderance of them, there are some who feel left out by the story that Scripture wants to tell. That they're struggling with the fact that if there are these pieces that are not working for me, that are not working for culture, that are not working for our present moment in history or the future that God wants us to grow into, then it is simply not for me. And so they find themselves in some ways throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying the Bible cannot be true and therefore it is not for me. This morning, friends, I want to talk about some ways through these deep questions. How it is we might be a faithful people together. But I want to name one that's really not for me. But it might be where you grew up. It might be the faith tradition of old. It might be a part of your inspiration for being a part of a church, even ours here in this place. And that's a word we call inerrancy. Inerrancy means that the Bible is without error in any place. That if it says it, it says it correctly, and it says it true. It relies on a pattern of that second phrase on the screen, verbal plenary inspiration. Verbal meaning word, plenary meaning whole, like a plenary session of people who are voting, it's the whole body, and then to inspire or to enthuse. It's a belief that every word of Scripture is inspired or maybe even dictated by God. Now, ultimately, it's not a terribly biblical position in errancy. It finds its resurgence and its, and its emphasis uh, just in the last 200 years. In the 19th and 20th century, out of the emergence of what we would call the fundamentalist church. It's without error on anything. And they make apologies for those places in Scripture where there does seem to be contradictions or struggles. Now those who participate in the pattern of inerrancy often have a preferred translation. And we know that for many it is the King James Version of Scripture, presuming that it is the earliest and most faithful English translation available to us from the the texts that were in Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Now here's the thing with this whole inspiration thing plenary meaning complete it is as if it is dictation the intent with inerrancy is to fence in the bible to protect it from doubt and criticism to say it is inerrantly true and any criticisms or struggles that you might have are a you problem friends i have to tell you that in the church your struggles are a we work It is an opportunity for us to work on and through them together, to live them faithfully. And the problem that I have with inerrancy is that for all the ways in which they are willing to attribute to God a perfect inspiration to get the text right the first time, they dismiss a pattern and power of God that says God can be present in translation, and more than that, God's Spirit can inspire you as a reader. What inerrancy suggests is there was a single time that God got it right in the translation of Scripture that we want to hold to be exclusively true. Now, 
My issue with inerrancy is a question of trust. Can we trust that that's true? And the pattern in my life is such that as I see these things that I can trust, not a one of them is perfect. If I was to ask you, are, are your parents in large part trustworthy? Or do you trust your parents? You're nodding. Were they perfect and right in everything? No. Camille, are your parents in large part trustworthy? Were they perfect and right in everything? Anybody willing to go to the cross around the idea that they trust their parents because they were flawless and never got anything wrong? No, but we live with a sense of we can trust that out of their love for us, out of their experience beyond ours, that they have lessons to teach us. And there might be places where they did get things wrong out of their background, out of their formation, out of misinformation that they'd had. Why is it possible for us to be able to do that good work of being able to assign trust to others and to learn to trust a pattern of life and the fruit that is born, but to not want to take that same authority when it comes to our relationship with what should be the most important book of all to us? It's a question of trust. Those who always want to debate inerrancy seem to have this sense that if you can't trust the Bible everywhere, then you can't trust it anywhere. I, I stand opposed to that mentality and that claim. There are parts of our scripture that are simply different. A simple one in this kind of season of year as we look for the ways in which Jesus has revealed himself to us is the ascension story when he ascends to heaven. The church makes an affirmation, even, if it's, even in its earliest creeds, that he ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God. But if you look at the gospel account, what you find is this, is that the gospel of Luke says that that happens in the Mount of Olives, the one that prepares us for the book of Acts. It says they sing a hymn in the room where the Last Supper takes place. They go outside in the Mount of Olives. They sing a hymn. They pray. Jesus ascends from there. At the beginning of the book of Acts, angels come and tell the disciples, what are you looking for? What are you waiting for? And they say, well, we thought he'd come back the way he went. So no, go back inside. Go back to Jerusalem and wait for him there, and he'll enthuse power to you. The Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is perceived in telling this exact same story, word gets to the disciples. Go to the Sea of Galilee where he called you, and he will meet you there. And it is on a mountaintop in Galilee where he ascends to heaven. Now, those stories cannot exclusively be true. They are 95 miles apart. And yet, for me, the importance is an affirmation of a Christ who lived, who died, who raised from the dead, and who ascends and will come again. And if there are specifics that somehow miss the mark for me, I'll be okay. Why? Because I think there are faithful alternatives to how we use our Scripture beyond this verbal plenary inspiration model of inerrancy and so one of the texts that often gets used to help us understand this type of passage comes from Paul's words to second Timothy let me share them with you all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work now, those who believe in a pattern of errancy read very heavily into the first part of that. All Scripture is God-breathed and is therefore useful in teaching. For me, the most important part of that is the second, is that the servant of God can learn a pattern about how we might be equipped for every good work, that Scripture is a breath upon us and helps us to understand who we are. So some alternatives, church, some ways of living into this faithfully. And I want to start with a couple of ideas, not unlike the Legos from last week, of some real world and practical understandings for me that help me make sense. The first is the idea of the biography. This revealed sense of someone's story and someone's life. So I raided my bookshelves and brought some types of biographies that I want to highlight for you this morning to provide you a, a, a sense of saying, yeah, that's what Scripture is kind of like for me. In places, it's definitely that. In other places, it's more like that. Because 
biography, or the words of life as we use them, are it's a very diverse field, and I want to highlight that for you this morning. The first is an autobiography with intent. And so I bring to you this morning Governor Schwarzenegger's newest book, Be Useful, Seven Tools for Life. I happen to like the way Arnold writes his stories. I often imagine it in his voice as I'm reading it, particularly he's talking about bodybuilding. But he provides seven tools for how you might have vision and live into it in the pattern that inspired him in his life to go from an Austrian bodybuilder who didn't speak English to building wealth to becoming the governor of the state of California and then recovering from a pattern after he blew his family up uh, in the midst of some very poor choices. It's a powerful book. His words with a lesson to teach. These are the seven things that I learned from my pattern of life that I want you to learn. Scripture could be, if it is in fact God breathed for the doing of good works, words that God wants us to have that are about the narrative that God is telling. Often the prophets build their biographies that way. The word of God came to Isaiah and said, The word of God came to Hosea and said. It's a sense by which my words are going to provide you instruction for the living of your life to make it better. A second pattern of biography. Dave Grohl's The Storyteller. Oh, great book. Um, If you grew up like I did in the 90s with Nirvana uh, and then have inherited the Foo Fighters since then, this is an amazing kind of travelogue and story. But more importantly, if you have parented children, his section on his daughters, Uh, is magnificent but this is just him storytelling about his experiences of the powerful days in his life at no point does he say these are the seven things you should learn no point does he say these are the ten commandments you should live by it is a story of his relationship with others of his love for music how he writes music the experiences that he had, what it meant to lose Kurt Cobain, what it meant to rediscover a love of music in a second band after being a part of one of the world's biggest bands for a short order of time. It's his story in his words. Sometimes the Bible's like that. Sometimes the Bible is like Bob Thomas's Walt Disney and American Original. This is a book that has been around for a long time. It's in the Disney archives, the original red leather-bound version of it. Bob Thomas was a reporter for the Associated Press. Over the course of 25 years, he interviewed Walt Disney and charted his progress as a leader developing first film and the animated series, and then his work towards Disneyland, and then Roy Disney's work on developing Disney World. The difference between this and, say, Dave Grohl is... Bob Thomas is not trying to tell Bob Thomas's story. He wants to tell Walt's story. But he's telling it because he has walked that path with Walt Disney for more than two decades. He's interviewed him at least once a year. He interviews members of his family. He visits the park as it is being built on the day that it opens. And on every time it's renovated, he gets a tour from Walt Disney. Disney puts on his cowboy boots and just walks through in Orange County and shows him off in Anaheim, all these places to be. This is someone who is telling a story that he has lived. It is someone else's story, but he's walked that path with him. It may be that the Bible, and this is a big one for me, is about people's attempt to tell God's story because they have walked with, they've struggled with, they've interviewed God, they've talked with people who love God and they want to live into that example. Because they've experienced it directly and it means the world to them. The fourth example is a little more challenging. It's David Downing's The Reluctant Convert. It's a story of C.S. Lewis. He's very clear and transparent right in the very introduction. I didn't know the man. My professors did. And they inspired a love for him. And so from meeting them and learning their stories and then reading everything I could about what everybody else said about the life of C.S. Lewis and his writings, the Chronicles of Narnia, the Screwtape Letters, all of those great books, I've developed this sense of who the man is and I want to share it with you. 
consider the difference. These are my words and an instruction for how you might live your life. I've done everything I can to faithfully recreate his story because I've heard from people who are passionate about it. The simple truth is, friends, our scripture is all of those things. The Gospel of Luke starts with the idea of Theophilus, God lover. In order to collect the stories of Jesus Christ, I write this passage to you. Paul will talk about the idea of the ways in which you have heard from a variety of people what is meant to be and what is to be true. Because the other great vision I have for how I view Scripture is actually not rooted in biography. I thought that was a helpful example. But it has to do with the idea of dance. And here's Danny Kay. <laughs> Things happen when you're dancing, right? I don't know why I did that with my body. It didn't feel right. <laughs> Here's the powerful image of dance for me. When we say dance, we don't think of one specific thing in harmony. When we add narrative to it, when we add music to it, we might begin to come closer to an understanding of uh, you know, what kind of dance might be happening. Right? We say something like swing dancing, waltz dancing, ballroom dancing, country line dancing, hip-hop dancing, free-form dancing. When we begin to add narrative to it, it begins to make more sense. But dance is a broad enough category that a lot of things fit into it. It is clearly a sense by which we move in response to the music and in many cases to a partner. For the whole of my ministry over the last 25 years, I've talked about the idea that for me the most important visual image I have is that the Bible is the best dance partner I have. There are times that I open it up and it reminds me of, of deep love, like a first dance with a bride or just slow dances with my soul. There are times when I open it up and the music and the dance that happens is more comfort. I'm barely even moving my feet, but Scripture can hold me just as I need to sway. There are times when I open Scripture and it's not unlike the gospel song the Chancel Choir sang where he inspires me and it gets my feet moving and I get excited and I can't help but have a stupid grin on my face. There are times when I need the Bible to take the lead. And there have been times in my life where I've said, I don't know that that pattern of footwork or where we've placed our hands is right for me. It's just not working. Let's try something else. So friends, I want to talk about some tools for a love of Scripture. Many of them come from Adam, and I'll add some of my own. The first is, use the lens of Jesus. Use the lens of Jesus. I start with the Gospels and the narrative of who Jesus is, because the Gospel of John said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word came to live among us. And therefore, that Word saturates our experience it helps us to understand the scriptures of old and the rest of the scriptures of new and all of our experience with them when i look through the lens of jesus i see an emphasis on the great commandment and the golden rule the great commandment matthew 22 love the lord with all your god or love the lord your god with all your heart your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment the second is like it love your neighbors you love yourself and then from Matthew 7, the golden rule, so in everything, do to others that you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. These truly for me are the words of God for the people of God, and so I with you say, thanks be to God. When I get into the weeds about everything else, I remember that through the lens of Jesus, there is somebody who comes along in the Gospels and said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you've heard it said. In the Scriptures, an eye for an eye. But I say to you, turn the other cheek and show mercy. Jesus Himself is in the process of trying to help live out the narrative of love of what it means to be incarnate of God. His vision, His lens is that of love, of compassion, of justice, and of mercy. Of a transformative work that takes those who are on the outside because they are sick, because they are disabled, because they are broken, because they are continuing in patterns of willful sinning 
and invites them back in. He refuses to take scriptures just at their face value. That's why when a woman gets dragged to his feet, says, this woman was caught in adultery, won't you sit, stone her? Jesus' response is to say, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. It's not going to be me. Other tools for your common work. Discuss. Debate. Some of the best parts of my week this last week have been people who've been reading the book that we're using in our small groups and who have texted me and said things like, how do you answer the question that's on page 13? Because they want to know what I think. That as we discuss and debate, not giving the right answers, but an answer that might be faithful and is true for me, we get better at our ability to be a good dance partner. Use your reason and experience. Use your reason and experience. My caution is, don't just throw things out, however, because they make you uncomfortable. There are plenty of places in Scripture where the inspiration of God is intended to unsettle you, to make you better. To not leave you where you were, but to invite you to someplace else. But if your reason and experience says this scripture is harmful, not to me, but to another, it is an opportunity to make space for doubt. And last and probably first is pray for the Holy Spirit. I said before, my great struggle with inerrancy is those who would say God's Spirit spoke once and got it right the first time. I believe that every time that I prepare for sermons as I do my own personal devotion. As I pray, it's an opportunity for the Spirit to continue to speak to me. I believe in a God that is alive and present even in the midst of my doubts, my struggles with texts. My invitation appears on the screen. Wrestle with it in the hopes that on the flip side, on the back side, as you come through it, it's an opportunity to find the words of life and light. Let's pray.